candidates, and I would like to welcome my audience and speakers to the first IEEE UK and Ireland Women in Engineering UK and Ireland Session Ambassadors Program with the title Early Career Talk. I would like to invite Dr. Nahamsi to open this webinar talk. Over to you, Doctor. Thank you very much, uh, Odwick. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Nagam Saeed, uh, the IEEE Women in Engineering UK and Ireland Ambassador Network Lead. I would like to welcome you and thank you for joining our Ambassador's first program, Early Career Talk webinar. Uh, the aim of this program is to uh, explore the audience to novel area and aspect of uh, engineering and computing, uh, which solves real world problem, and also to establish a link for networking and uh, mentorship, and uh, to establish links with industry and to create connection for research opportunity. I will return back uh, to other work so she can present our agenda for today. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Naham. Okay, and so um, just to let you know that the event, the presentation will be recording a live broadcast and um, on the IEEE session region at YouTube. Um, there will be one question for the audience after each presentation. And so you do well to um, provide your email um, for the e-evaluation form if you want to receive your um, certificate, uh, which will be received within four days. And um, before we start, um, there are some um, housekeeping notes we have to. Um, you have to make um, take note of um, if you notice that you are muted and you can use the camera and that's because to keep everything in order and if you have questions that occur to you during the talk and you don't want to lose the track of please do well to type into the QA session and we will address them at the end um, of the um, each speaker's presentation and so please when you want to ask question um, do well um, to um, address it to the right um, speaker and we'll try to answer them after the end of the four presentation. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to um, the first speaker, um, which will be on telecommunication for the session. So over to you, Eh Iman. Hello everybody. So uh, I'm Iman el -Dusuki. I'm uh, IEEE Women in Engineering, UK and Ireland Ambassador. So um, uh, I already joined the IEEE uh, Women in Engineering since 2016, and I've been helping in um, the first conference for young entrepreneurs, and it was the, the first event in UK and Ireland, and it was very successful, and it was the initiation of a series of successful events. And here I'm now uh, participating in uh, this event. Uh, it is the, the first uh, workshop and it's the first activity for the ambassadors program. So I hope it will be uh, the same as the previous activities. It will be the, the, initi uh, the initial event of a successful of series events. Um, I'm a uh, computer engineer. So uh, I am already working in the IoT and blockchain consultant for uh, companies to help them in their journey for towards digital transformation um, and towards their journey to be CMMI certified. Besides this, I'm already working um, in the telecommunication field. Uh, I've been working since eight years uh, in the telecommunication company. Uh, and since then we already faced many uh, fraud cases. Uh, and that's why I started my research. Um, my master's was in telecommunication fraud detection as well. So, um, 
so um, I already did this masters uh, and it was about um, the algorithms and the techniques of the telecommunication fraud detection. It was really a, a great achievement as well. So that's why I thought of sharing with you this experience about the academic field and the industrial field. So we'll now uh, start my presentation. I hope everybody now can can see my slides. Yes, we can. So, okay. So the title of the presentation is Telecommunication Fraud Detection. So we'll first talk about the, the fraud itself, and then we'll talk about the telecommunication fraud. Uh, after that, we'll talk about the techniques and algorithms of telecommunication fraud and in practical life how the companies are dealing with these uh, techniques to uh, detect the fraud and to uh, uh, prevent the fraud afterwards. So the first thing is what is fraud in general? So generally speaking, the fraud is the crime of obtaining money by deceiving people. So it's a theft of service or abuse of service. So uh, it's the dishonest use of service with the intention to avoid service charge. And that's why we have uh, fraud cases in each field around us. We have fraud in the insurance, we have fraud in the credit cards, we have fraud in the property, in the software, in the telecommunication, that is our main topic today. And even uh, because the, the fraudsters are trying to find any way just to steal money. So in the medical field, uh, since the, the rise of the pandemic, so now we have uh, COVID-19 fraud as well. So this is how people are just trying to do workarounds just to steal money from others. And if we are going to take a talk specifically about that click communication fraud, so the telecommunication fraud is any transmission of voice or data across the telecommunication network where the intent of the sender to avoid paying any charges or at least paying part of the charges. So why I chose this topic specifically to talk about with you today? Uh, I have actually two reasons. The first one is a personal because uh, I have a great experience in telecommunication field and uh, fraud specifically because I've been working there and we faced a lot of fraud cases where we tried to detect some of them. We tried to prevent other fraud cases. So it was a, a long journey in this field and my research area was as well in this field. So I have the two hats, the, the research and the academic part and I have the industrial part. So that's why I thought maybe this is a, a good experience to talk about. This is the first thing. The second thing that the mobile communication has already be, become an integral part of our lives. So now we have around 5.22 billion mobile user. And this is not a small number because this number is around 66.6% of the world population. And it will not stop like that. Actually, the, the, statistics, the statistics say that the mobile user yearly growth reach 1.8%. So every year we have more mobile users and accordingly, the fraudsters will have more and more um, ways to get more money. So we reach on 2020 revenue loss in the telecommunication companies was $11 billion, which is really a great amount. That's why I said, let's focus on this area. Let's have some solutions or at least let's see what's happening. So our question is, uh, is the telecommunication fraud occurs in a specific part in the telecommunication system? Actually, the answer is no. So each part of the system uh, is facing fraud. So we have fraud in the, in the CDRs, we have fraud in the customer care system, we have fraud in the prepaid system, postpaid system. So every part in the telecommunication system is facing fraud. Um, 
actually, to the extent that we have more than 20 type, uh, sorry, not 20, 200 types of telecommunication fraud, like the, the roaming fraud. So the roaming is very popular because many people, when they are traveling abroad, they don't want to pay much money in the roaming calls. However, they want to use the service. So uh, this is a, a very popular type of the telecommunication fraud. We have the um, call transfer fraud, the dealer's fraud, subscription fraud. So there are many types so many types of telecom fraud up to 200 or maybe more. So what the researchers are doing with this? So the academic persons and the researchers are looking very deep in, the, in this problem and they are trying to find many ways that they are using sometimes machine learning. So why not try to use the artificial intelligence and sometimes more into the data mining and sometimes more into probabilistic model and go, going deeper into different algorithms like the K nearest neighbor, the support vector machine, the logistic regression, and then they are trying to do maybe if one or two or three is not enough. So why not we combine many of them together as much as we can so we can use the regression P together with the association rule mining and together with the clustering and then uh, focus more on the variables focus more on the complexity of the algorithms and to be honest some of the researchers uh, already got a very good results to the extent that some of the programs already uh, can detect 99.81% of the fraud cases, which is really an amazing uh, result. But what we are thinking about is, is it what the industrial persons need or is it what the telecommunication companies want and this is what they are looking for? So this is the other side of the problem. So in 2020, when we are saying that the revenue loss was $11 billion, uh, however, the revenue was 1,071 billion, which means like the revenue loss is around 0.9 or maybe 1% of their revenue. The statistics say that from 2016 till 2020, so it was 1,000 billion, the revenue, and it reached 1,071. And from 2020, the next five years, it will be, it will rise from 1,071 billion till 1,147 billion. So the increase in revenue is relatively higher than the increase in the revenue loss, which is caused from the, um, telecommunication fraud. So this is one thing. Uh, the other thing that the industry and the telecommunication companies has different priorities. So it's very important for them, for example, the branding, um, the name of the company. So when we are saying that uh, we will do some fraud detection techniques, uh, but we will delay the launch, for example, of 6G. So this is for them is nonsense. So the better is the name of the company who will launch first the 6G, and this is, will be forever uh, the name of the company. And this for them is more valuable than losing some money. So they are looking for time to market. They are looking for scalability of a solution. So since we are thinking that the number of uh, mobile users is increasing every year, so they are thinking that uh, it's very important to have a very scalable solution, a very reliable solution, other than it's very accurate and it gets high uh, percentage of fraud detection. Although uh, the, the telecommunication companies, when they are losing some money, they are losing some of their confidentiality and they are losing, losing some of their uh, customer trust. However, on the other side, they are gaining many other things that they are getting their services quicker. They are uh, 
producing more new services, which for them is in the competitive of the market. So this is more important for them. So what we already, the, the result that we read that the targets in the research and academic area is totally different from the targets of the industrial companies. So we need to look closer to the market need and we need to check the industrial priorities. And finally, so what we need to do practically is an extensive gap analysis. Again, it's recommended industry standards is needed. And then we can offer a plan to close identified gaps. So, by this, I, I finished my talk uh, and I hope you enjoyed it. The next one will be more academic one. Uh, and I will leave the mic now for Udwa to present. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Iman. And um, that was a great session. And um, so we're going to go into the, um, the next presentation. Um, which is going to be um, more academic. That's the advanced technological approaches in preserving the future of our forest and woodland. So at this point, I'll leave the floor to Livia. Thank you very much, Woodwork, for the introduction. And thank you very much, everyone, for being here today. Uh, my name is Livia Lantini, and I am a PhD researcher at the University of West London. And also, I would like to thank uh, Nagam for inviting me uh, to this talk. So, uh, I will now share my screen. Can you see it? Yes, we can. Yes, okay. we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, the project title is, as you can see, Advanced Technological Approaches in Preserving the Future of Our Forests and uh, Woodlands. And it deals with the health monitoring of trees and the investigation of tree root systems using ground penetrating radar. Uh, before we start, just a few words about myself. I am a civil engineer. I got my bachelor degree from Roma Tre University in Rome, Italy in 2014. After that, I decided to continue my education with a master's degree and I got my major in road, road transportation and infrastructure engineering in 2017. In this period, my supervisor introduced me to the world of non-destructive testing and ground penetrating radar, which became my main area of interest. It was actually very inspiring. And I therefore decided to deepen my knowledge in this research area by undertaking a PhD at the University of West London, uh, whose thesis I recently successfully defended. And the talk I am about to give refers to some of the main findings of my PhD, which are also widely published um, and presented at international conferences. So to start, I am going to briefly introduce the topic I am doing research on. Nowadays, our trees and woodlands are under threat by a number of pests and diseases. Here I cited just some of them, which are among the so-called emerging infectious diseases. Their incidence in Europe is rapidly increasing, often leading to the death of entire forests. Also, such infections can affect the stability of the tree, the stability of slopes, and the erosion of soil, and the interaction between trees and the built environment. In fact, as you can imagine, urban trees closely interact with building foundations, underground utilities, and road infrastructures. So to this effect, it is crucial to identify decays at the very early stage of development and limit their effect on tree health. In terms of measurements, these are traditionally carried out using destructive methods. These methods are usually costly, time-consuming, and laborious, and they only allow the assessment of the tree condition at the time point of sampling. It is also important to emphasize that these techniques often initiate damage and contrib contribute to the beginning of the fungal infection. So for these reasons, the questions that led to my research project are, are the existing assessment methods suitable and adequate for the evaluation of trees, conditions, and health? Are the informations provided by the traditional methods adequate for the understanding of the early symptoms of diseases? 
And finally, and most importantly, how can the early detection of decays in trees be improved? The answer to these questions lies in the non-destructive testing methods, which are gaining momentum as they allow tests to be repeatable and um, most importantly, don't bring harm to the trees. Among these, uh, these techniques, ground penetrating radar is one of the most reliable in view of its versatility, rapidity of data collection, and the provision of reliable results at a relatively limited cost. So for those of you who don't know it yet, a ground penetrating radar or GPR is a non-destructive testing technique that using radio frequency electromagnetic energy for the assessment of the subsurface or man-made constructions without affecting their original structure. During a GPR uh, detection, high frequency electromagnetic energy generated by a transmitting antenna propagates into the ground as waves. When radar waves pass across interfaces between media with different electrical or magnetic properties, reflections are generated. And then a portion of the energy will be reflected back to the surface and recorded by the receiving antenna, while the remaining continues to propagate deeper until it is completely attenuated. So in view of what I have introduced, the main aim of this research was focusing on the early identification of 3 dk and detection of 3 disease using mainly GPR. The objective of the projects are summarized here in the slide below and uh, concern the development of a GPR data processing methodology for the 3D with, uh, visualization of tree root systems, the implementation of a dedicated advanced signal processing methodology, and finally, getting information about root density. So in order to answer these questions, I am following a methodology based on full-scale inspection from a laboratory environment to field investigations. Laboratory tests, in fact, are needed to investigate the electromagnetic properties of wood in a controlled environment. Numerical simulations are essential to analyze multiple experimental scenarios, for example, in the investigation of the interconnections between uh, different tree root systems. And also, it is helpful to validate the outputs of the modeling stage, where different algorithms are tested in order to automate tree root tracking. So what were the achievements of these projects? Well, in first instance, a dedicated data, process, uh, data collection techniques, I'm sorry, for tree root investigation. As you can see from the animation, data were collected in a circular scan lines around the trees in order to ensure a quasi-perpendicular scanning of tree roots, uh, because these ones, as you might uh, imagine, commonly develop radially from the trunk. Then a dedicated signal processing scheme uh, was developed for uh, tree root mapping. As you can see, uh, the first GPR output, the ones that you see on the left side, they are called uh, B-scans, and they are the main outputs of a GPR investigation. If you see the first one, uh, you can easily imagine that it's uh, heavily affected by a huge amount of noise. So to uh, reduce the chances of data misinterpretation, uh, advanced data processing techniques, such as, for example, the singular value decomposition and the FK migration were applied to clean the data and single out the response of the roots, which are the ones that you see now in green dots. After that, a multi-phase algorithm was developed, which analyzes the GPR data and recreates a 3D reconstruction of the tree root system architecture. This one is the output of one of the, uh, of the surveys I carried out during my PhD, and where we can see that root paths were recognized and reconstructed uh, by the algorithm. The difference in uh, color that you see now is just because of the different depth of the different roots. So the ones in red are the most shallow one, while the blue ones are the deepest ones. So the last uh, achievement of my uh, PhD research was the calculation of a novel index for the estimation of tree root density and the investigation of areas of root system interconnection. So by using the formula that you see now on screen, uh, we were able to identify areas of higher uh, root density among the uh, investigated um, volume of soil. 
So the one that you are seeing now is an animation of one of the surveys that were carried out during my uh, PhD in a park in uh, West London, Walpole Park. Uh, we investigate one of the uh, most ancient trees of the park. One of the results that we achieved in this regard was the creation of density maps. As you can see, the depth is increasing and the density of the roots at that particular depth is shown. So what we can achieve with that? We can achieve that these maps can be created over time. So we can create, uh, we can make GPR surveys around that same tree over time, like, I don't know, once every two months, once every three months, and then we can compare the outputs at different depths and see if the um, density of roots is increasing, which is the uh, result that we should be expecting if the tree is growing, or if it's decreasing. So, for example, this may be a sign of uh, um, a disease for which the roots are dying and therefore not shown anymore in the maps. So in conclusion, the results that I've shown so far have proven the viability of the proposed methodology for mapping root systems, and in particular, the advanced in signal processing have contributed to the removal, the automatical removal of uh, noise-related features from the acquired data. And the developed multi-phase algorithm was proven um, um, using several surveys, was proven suitable in detecting main uh, root features, for example, the position of the roots and their path. And finally, uh, it was proven that the GPR is capable of providing density maps at different depths. So definitely GPR, which is, uh, as I told you before, a technique used mostly for detecting uh, man-made um, structures, is proving to be a valid technique and an effective alternative to traditional root testing methods. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I hand it back to Udwak that will introduce the next speaker. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Olivia. That was a great presentation. And so thank at you. this juncture, I would like to invite Dr. Naham to take the floor for the networking session. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Adwak. Uh, just uh, for the next uh, couple of minutes, we would like to do a little bit of uh, networking. Uh, so as I mentioned before, one of our uh, program aim is to establish uh, links uh, for uh, mentorship and uh, establish some connections. So we would like the attendees just to introduce themselves to us if they would like to get any support from uh, our side. The best thing to do because you are muted, just to raise your hand and we will uh, uh, allow you to use your mic and introduce yourself uh, to us and let us know if we, we can support you in any way. Uh, or if you just want to introduce yourself uh, to the others, just you can uh, write in the chat box your uh, email. So uh, uh, the other attendees and also the speakers, they can communicate with you. So I will leave it to you just uh, if you've got uh, any, if you would like to introduce yourself, just uh, raise your hand. I think you can, you can see the hand uh, with the toolbar, just so you can use it so we can uh, and mute you, uh, or just you write in the chat box uh, your email, you introduce yourself, uh, and uh, um, just everyone can know who you are so they can contact you. If you are willing to do so, of course. Sure, just a couple of minutes and then we will return back uh, to introduce the third speaker.
Martina, she's doing a very interesting topic. I wonder if she would like to elaborate more about the um, uh, citizen uh, sensing. Hi. Hello, Martina. Martina yeah. Hi, Dan. <laughs> Sorry, there. I was trying to turn over there. And um, yeah, I'm doing a project on citizen sensing, looking at climate change and um, looking at how um, people's data is being used um, for the good, you know, of climate change and uh, environmental project that we're working on is um, we're looking into uh, is in Dingle in in Ireland. So um, yeah, so that's just trying to sum it up on it that I'm start working on at the minute. Yeah, I don't know what more to. No, it's really very happen. interesting. It's really we would like to hear more because it's really interesting and we are looking forward to read your first publication uh, on this topic. Thank you. Yeah, she's just currently look, looking at some research, research at the minute, so. Mm -hmm. Maybe we'll have you then uh, when you publish something, when you start publishing, we will have you to be one of our speakers in one of our events. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. <laughs> We're looking forward for that day. Thank you very much, Martina. Okay. So, Odovic, if you don't mind, if we can continue with our agenda. All right, sure, not down. That's we, we can do that. Yep. Okay. Okay. Um. All right. Um. Thank you, Nadan. That was a great um, session, networking session. And so we're going to move to our third speaker, which um, she will be presenting on them using AI best human identification in improving surveillance system efficiency. And so our third speaker is Emine Alajimi. At this juncture, I'd like to open the floor to our third speaker. Emine, you're welcome. Um. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Uduk, for this introduction. And thank you for all of you for uh, preparing for this session, um, especially Dr. Nakhon Said. I'm so happy and so proud to participate with you in this uh, event. Um, OK, let's share my screen with you. Um, Uduk, can you stop your sharing your screen? OK, thank you. Um, OK. Uh, let's start my presentation. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Iman Lajrami. I'm uh, a new PhD student. I just uh, joined the University of West London to study my PhD. And my talk will be about using AI for human identification to improve civilian systems efficiency. Okay, a brief uh, bio about myself. I have a um, bachelor degree in computer science from the Islamic University of Gaza, Palestine. Then I got another bachelor degree in engineering, specifically in software engineering from the University of Palestine. And I have a master's degree from Jordan with distinction. And currently I am a PhD student at the University of West London. I um, have an experience in the academic work. So I was a lecturer of computing for more than 10 years. And uh, I uh, had many uh, positions during my work. Uh, one of them is the head of multimedia department of the IT from uh, 2016 till 2000, uh, 2021. And I was a former director of the faculty of IT from 2012 till 2015. And uh, my research interest in, uh, in artificial intelligence, uh, specifically machine learning and deep learning. Okay. Uh, my talk will be about introduction to AI applications and AI civilian systems and using AI in civilian systems and the results we got from this uh, application and some other applications and conclusion. As everyone knows that uh, 
uh, AI is a huge topic and uh, is used everywhere almost in our lives. So is, uh, it is the science about how to make machines think and behave like humans. It is a brief definition to know what is the artificial intelligence. Machine learning and deep learning are the most popular uh, and promising fields of AI that we can apply in our applications and get better results in uh, uh, such uh, areas like prediction, prediction, recognition, and other areas of uh, AI purposes. So scientists have developed lots of algorithms and libraries that can be used in many applications. Uh, its application include reports, business intelligence, business intelligence, big data analysis, Internet of Things, recognition, protection, detection, and recommender systems, text analysis, and many other topics. But what the most of it, what I am interested in is that image analysis and computer vision. And I use the uh, idea about uh, applying this in video systems and many other applications. So I will talk about using AI in surveillance systems. You know, surveillance systems cameras used uh, everywhere for security purposes or monitoring. Uh, we can see cameras, CCTV cameras in the streets and uh, uh, in front of buildings for security or also inside the buildings itself, like banks and other organizations and institutes. How uh, does these CCTV cameras work? Most of the old uh, version of cameras uh, record all the time, recording continuously. Uh, some others, which is recently developed and modern technology used and using AI techniques, record when a motion is detected. So the last uh, era of uh, CT CCTV cameras was using motion detection. And we here in London see them in the streets. When you move in the front of the camera, you can see that the light of this camera is uh, on and the, it is start recording. The idea is about to optimize the uh, uh, process of recording and storing videos that are captured via these cameras. So if your camera is recording all the time continuously, you need a huge storage to store the videos resulted in, in this process. And when you need to investigate or search in these videos, you will waste a long time to, to reach what you are seeking for. So in 19, in, in, sorry, in 2019, Amazon and Nestle provided intelligent CCTV cameras that can detect motion, human face, or body, but they were very expensive or relatively expensive. So the traditional cameras, which cost maybe from uh, $300 to $1,500, used to record continuously. It's, it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't have AI techniques to uh, optimize the process of recording, while Amazon and Nest cameras may be cost from $300 to, to $500. To $500. So it is a relatively, a relatively expensive cost for a normal user or a company which do not need to does not need to replace its camera system. So OpenCV provides libraries that can be used for object detection, face detection, and the human body detection. That was the idea. Why not to use these pre-trained applications and the pre-trained algorithms that offered uh, uh, open source uh, by OpenCV and the free applications and the free algorithms to, to apply them in our system so we can make the traditional camera work as intelligent as the modern or expensive camera. This is the idea about applying a OpenCV library hard cascade in our application. It is an using intelligent serial systems, using AI-based systems, and the objective is to optimize the recording process itself. The, I, the, the results or the conclusion or the benefit of from applying this application is to save storage and improve the efficiency of surveillance systems. Uh, this work was published in the IEEE uh, conference, International Conference on Promising Electronic Technologies in uh, 2019. Okay, the idea is about using deep learning in detection if there in the camera scope is a human or a face then the, trigger, uh, the application will trigger the camera to start recording. So 
two approaches of deep learning were, were used here, face detection approach and the human detection approach. The face detection approach is, very, is a ready application used from the uh, algorithm is used from the OpenCV library, which is an open source. It's used hard like feature, hard like features, and hard cascades classifier and artificial neural networks to uh, to detect whether in a scene or in an image there is a face, as you see in this image. And the other uh, algorithm that was used is to detect if there is a human body in front of the camera or in the camera range of recording so it's used the histogram of area of real gradient which is known as hog and a support vector machine and use hard rtt features with ada boost training these applications are trained by opencv for a huge volume of data set of human faces and human bodies and it it gives very accurate uh, results so the application will work like this when you start your camera, when your camera is on, whatever the type of camera, uh, it will view the scene in front of the uh, camera uh, scope. So the, you, you need to detect what mode you enable your camera on. If you want to record when a body is detected, you need to uh, provide uh, or detect the mode is body. If you need uh, it to record when a face is detected, you need to turn on the face detection approach. So if you use body, then we will uh, trigger our algorithm with use body detection weights. And other, on the other hand, if we used face detector, we use a face detector weight. So if there is, it will ask if there is detected a human or a face in front of the camera, the camera will start recording. So the process of recording itself is, got, is governed by this application. So you connect your camera to this application to trigger when the camera will start to record. That means that the camera will not record all the time. It just will start recording when a human or a face in front of its scope or in front of the camera. And then it's a real-time application. So in every scene is, uh, is linked to the application and in every scene it's con continuous process that the same is uh, gonna to be used. Is uh, there a human or a face in the camera will start recording, otherwise we'll, we will stop recording. So the results from this application, it's a very simple application and the print user interface. Uh, it was offered for free for companies that use uh, uh, cheap cameras and uh, CCTV cameras. Recording as a human body is detected or a recording as face is detected. And this is where it use the storage, uh, which is needed for storing videos from the camera. The installation parameters was any camera used 30 frames per second or in the resolution of 1920 by 720 color depth 16 bit per pixel. Uh, the accuracy is the evaluation is very perfect for face detection. It was at uh, 96.1 and for body detection it was 99 because this algorithm is pre-trained via the OpenCV libraries for a huge data set of a human body and the human faces and the idea is uh, here is you don't identify who is the person as you just it is a face not who is this face belongs to so if you need to uh, to to add future work and we need to do uh, this work and to identify for who's this face, we need a data set for previously uh, data uh, stored in the company for the faces that can be uh, recognized through the camera. So just it is trigger a recording when a face is in front of the camera or a body is in front of the camera. So the efficiency pair was on evaluation. The storage is reduced almost 27% compared with recording 24 hours per seven days recording. So sometimes uh, this is a relative lead ratio because sometimes you, there is no one passes through the camera and another day all people pass in the front in this place. Uh, we take in consideration that maybe a holiday in the front of the business or institution, in situation and uh, it's a full day. So it is relatively compared our, according to our survey, low cost cameras in addition, 
low cost cameras can work efficiently as high cost ones. We mean by high, high cost ones, the new cameras that was proposed uh, by Amazon and Nest, they are, uh, who's uh, providing these facilities. They launched them in the beginning of 2020. These cameras was very expensive, $400. If you need the, all the, faci uh, the facilities, motion detection, uh, face detection, or body detection. So we, we make we made the traditional camera, which is cheap and not intelligent, to work in an intelligent way by linking this camera IP, its IP address with our application, which was applied on Linux, and uh, apply our algorithm so in every scene, so the camera will start recording just only if there is one condition of our conditions available, which is there is a human or there is a body. And maybe you ask why not motion detection? The motion detection is already provided by many uh, companies and is already in most of the cameras. And when you see a face or a body, you, you are certain in a human, not in anything are moving. So when we use motion detection, if a car is moved uh, or is moving or uh, sorry an animal is moving in front of the camera the camera would record this movement but we was certainly focusing on a human for security purposes for a specific purpose application for some companies and the target group of this application was satisfied with the results that they got from the efficiency and optimizing the recording process okay that's all about the using AI in uh, surveillance systems. Other application related that we use uh, already applications of AI and deep learning and gender and age estimation through a user's photo or a picture of the user. So the purpose of this uh, paper, and it was published last year, age and gender prediction and validation through single user image using CNN. Uh, it's to validate the user gender and age range that reflected from his photo correctly. So also adding a double check layer validator by linking between user photo, gender, and date of birth from inputs based on deep learning approach using conversion neural networks. It is our service to make the validation process is implemented and evaluated on the University of Palestine students' photos and show uh, so so it uh, has achieved a good result in gender prediction and we have some challenges in age prediction and it is because of the user when they upload their photo sometimes they use old photos and sometimes use photos that have image processing applications like photoshop and change the the true features of the person itself so this is to validate that the input of the user for his birth date or his age is relatively uh, connected to its, his uh, photo or her photo. So this is the idea about validating that your photo in the system is up to date, uh, connecting with your age and your birth of date and your gender. And uh, my recent uh, application and my recent research project is uh, when I joined the University of uh, West London, I will uh, work my PhD on uh, deep learning in computer vision, specifically in medicine and medical image processing. It is an automated medical image processing using deep learning, using CNN in cardiac images, classification, segmentation, and the prediction to help cardiologists to make right decision. Uh, to investigate whether computers can learn uh, to automate the process of image analysis, and it is an essential step toward comprehensive computer-assisted interpretation. So computers can behave uh, more accurate than human in the future, in my opinion. Uh, in conclusion, to sum up, AI has been applied in almost every discipline in our lives business, education, medicine, and industry. Deep learning is the most promising field in AI for achieving a high accuracy in prediction and, and recognition. It is worth to investigate further in this area. And this is what I'm doing my PhD on now. Uh, that's all about what I was to, to let you know about the recent topics of AI that I have uh, applied. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this session. Thank you so much for your listening and attendance, and I'm ready to hear any question at the end of this uh, workshop. Thank you so much, and see you later.
Thank you so much, Emma. Um, that was a great one. And I believe that um, our audience will have questions um, during the QA session. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, without um, taking much of our time, and um, so I would like to um, encourage our participants and to um, send in your questions and using the um, QA chat room. And so we could attend to it at the end of it. And so we would like to go to our um, last speaker for today, um, which she's going to be talking um, on optical vibro sensing for buffer processing applications. And so at this juncture, I'd like to invite um, Sanuba Fahim to take the floor. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Sanova Fahim Neyman, and I'm a PhD researcher in uh, Optical Fiber Sensors Research Center at Electronic and Computer Engineering Department, University of Limerick Ireland. Um, I would like to thank um, Dr. Nagam and her team for IEEE UK Ireland Ambassador Program to give me an opportunity to talk about my research and my uh, findings in daily life examples of engineering. Um, and um, all, all the speakers' uh, presentation was really great. Uh, so I would like to share my screen now. Um. Great. So, yeah, is I. I hope my screen is visible. Is it? Yes. So you just need to um, maximize it. Hello. I can hear you. I can see your screen. You can see my screen. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Bill. So, um, um. Today, I will be talking about optical fiber sensing for biofuel processing applications. And this is a uh, major area of my PhD research. And uh, my PhD, uh, main PhD advisor is Professor Alfred Liebes um, from the Department of Electronic and Computer Engineering, University of Limerick. And my joint supervisors are Professor Jay Tony from Pembroke from the Department of Chemical Sciences and Vernon Institute, University of Limerick Island, and Professor Bhavani Shankar Chaudhary from Iran University of Engineering and Technology, Pakistan. Um, so before uh, starting uh, the presentation, I would like to give a small introduction about myself. Um, I originally belong to Pakistan and uh, an electronics engineer. I did my Bachelor of Engineering in Electronic Engineering and Master of Engineering in Electronic System Engineering from Meran University of Engineering Technology, Pakistan. And before starting my PhD at University of Limerick, I was working in the uh, in Meran University as a lecturer for more than three years and have been teaching a variety of subjects to engineering students, such as artificial neural networks, uh, fuzzy systems, instrumentation and measurement, electromagnetic uh, and radiating fields and systems, uh, and basic electronics as well. So uh, if anyone's interested in um, uh, looking at my profile, uh, uh, my links are available on the, on the slide. Fiber sensors for high resolution ethanol concentration and in modern biofuel reactor systems. And um, I have mentioned some of my research interests and key capabilities. Um, in order to just introduce for networking, if anyone wants to get in touch regarding these uh, fields. So this is a brief outline uh, of my presentation today. Um, so uh, I'll be discussing about industrial automation, sensors and industry 4.0 IoT in biofuel processing applications. And my um, research is uh, specifically based for sensing needs of biofuel production using LDA. So I'll be talking about that. Um, basic uh, of optical fiber sensors. This is the technology that we are using for this uh, application. And research on, uh, on these sensor designs for ultra low level ethanol concentration measurement, 
some of the uh, significant findings and results in my current research. So starting with the uh, industrial automation is um, we know that sensors have become part of our daily life as the technology is advancing. Similarly, they are um, key elements of industrial automation. Data from sensors help to monitor the health of equipment, fault detection and prediction to improve the reliability and efficiency of processing plants and process control systems. I have named some of those sensors here, such as uh, environmental sensors, which are used for monitoring pressure, relative humidity and temperature. Proximity sensors, which are used for the presence of or distance from objects without any physical touch, specifically in the application because the high temperature uh, things are um, used or toxic chemicals probably. And um, next is image sensors. And these are the backbone of computer vision technology and they are used for imaging purposes such as counting objects and their properties. Vibration and motion sensors are used for condition monitoring, leveling and positioning, shock and fall detection around the manufacturing plants. And lastly, the process sensors. They are used for monitoring the moisture, concentration, pH, and temperature in processing applications. Say, it biofuel processing applications, food processing, uh, medicine, varnishes, beverages, anything. So this is a general idea of how industrial automation is impacted by the presence of sensors. IoT or Internet of Things Industry 4.0 is a current manufacturing trend where big data is one of the trademarks. This actually refers to the collection of set of data by sensors related to process and product manufacturing. As it can be seen in the picture on the right side, that in a microalgal biorefinery, there are several processes such as uh, seed culturing, um, process dewatering, product extraction, and packaging. So a control, a PLC industrial controller is used to receive information and log it to database. And database also collects data from a network of sensors. This can provide the data regarding different processes. This could allow the operators, you know, the end users or uh, the ones who work on the chemical process to man monitor the algal growth and production in real time. Going a step further in this um, uh, advancement in uh, smart manufacturing, um, this data help in creating a digital twin of the facility and proper data analysis can help predict future yield and adjust operations seeing the demand. So from this, we can see the need of sensors, real time, portable, easy to be implemented sensors in the industry. As I discussed earlier that my project is based on um, biofuel production and sensing needs for uh, algal biothermal production. So before going in detail, I would give a brief introduction about the biofuel production. So as we know that there is huge demand for fossil fuels and this is continuously increasing. So the alternative energy resources um, have been explored since two decades. Biomasses are one of the major renewable energy resources and they are used to produce biofuels and bioproducts. Depending on the source of biomass, biofuels are divided into generations. First generation of biofuels were uh, produced using food-based or animal sources such as vegetable oils, high starch, and high carbohydrate uh, crops. Second generation of biofuels depended on known food uh, plants, such as woody plants like uh, bamboo. And the third generation of biofuels are based on algal cells, and they are also called as smart, bright green um, biomachines. One of the main biofuel produced using LA is biothermal, and they can also be used to produce other bioproducts and biodiesel. So, chemical, um, so our, our research center is working in collaboration with chemical sciences department at GG Well in University of Limerick, who are working on the project of producing biothermal using cyanobacteria cyanocystis, which is actually uh, the production of biothermal by implementing metabolic engineering to aid genes to the cyanobacteria that makes it produce ethanol. So main elements of this chemical process involve sunlight, carbon dioxide, water, and nutrients. With this method, we talk about the amount of production of ethanol. Um, 
The initial rate of production of bioethanol is in the range of 0.1 to 0.5 gram per liter per day. This corresponds to 0.0126% volume to volume to 0.0633% volume to volume uh, production per liter per day. If we convert this change into RIU, refractive index unit, it brings it to 10 raised to minus 7 RIU change in the solution, which is the very high resolution that is required from the sensor or sensing uh, solution. So, in order to effective industry level bioethanol production uh, using LG, there is a requirement of a real time sensing approach to measure uh, very small concentration changes of ethanol in the solution. Hence, uh, uh, my research is based on developing optical fiber sensing solution for measuring ultra low level ethanol in modern biofuel reactor systems. Now the point is that uh, what uh, what industry was uh, doing before. So we have um, there are other uh, sensing approaches available, but they uh, they they are not portable. The instrumentation is very expensive. We see about the smart manufacturing system. We need real time and portable systems. So these optical fiber sensors can give us this uh, availability. And in, in the other drawback of the PS method is the potential loss of the fuel, and which is very uh, expensive um, loss. So after this, as I'm saying that um, I am using optical fiber sensing technology for this application, um, I uh, would like to discuss uh, some basics of fiber optic sensors. So a fiber optic sensor is a sensor that uses an optical fiber, which is um, uh, which is um, a circular waveguide. It is uh, either used as a sensing element uh, called an intrinsic sensor, or as means of relaying signals from a remote sensor to the electronics that process the signals, such as extrinsic extrinsic sensors. So these sensors or based on the sensors based on optical fibers have the capability of translating a change in the surrounding environmental signal or analyte into optical signals and transmitting information about the required parameter in real time. They also have advantages such as immunity to electromagnetic interference, inexpensive implementation, possibility of remote sensing, small size and lightweight and high sensitivity. A basic optical fiber sensing system includes a light source, uh, as you can see in this picture, uh, fiber optic and a light detector. The, the next thing is environmental signal. That environmental signal can be temperature, pressure, pH, um, strain, refractive index, concentration. So it depends on your application and what you are working on and what design you are working on um, and what application you are working on. So here are some, uh, say some discussion about the sensor design that I have explored for this application. I've been exploring uh, various sensor designs uh, for high resolution ethanol concentration measurement. Uh, one of the sensor lines that has shown significant, significant results for this application is U-Bend Emancent Wave uh, Sensor, which is based on Emancent Wave Interaction Principle with the surrounding medium. So now what is Emancent Waves? I will go back to the basics first. So the principle of transmission of light along the optical fiber um, is based on total internal reflection where you know light hits the core and reflects back again to the core inside this waveguide and this uh, light propagation can be can be divided into two parts the guided field in the core as you can see in this picture there is a u bend uh, fiber here and uh, it's surrounded with the cladding and inside is the core material so um the guided field in the core and the expon exponentially decaying Evanson field in the cladding. And that Evanson field, which is in the cladding, are called as cladding moves. They use, this usually decreases to zero in the cladding before reaching the external medium. So to enhance the interaction of this field with the surrounding medium, uh, to tune this interaction, there are many methods like tapering, deforming the fiber in the in different types of bends, uh, coil, U-bend, um, um, uh, maybe like uh, S-shape. So what we have done in here is uh, we have deformed the fiber in the U-bend. This actually enhances the two main properties 
uh, of these sensors to increase the sensitivity, that is penetration depth and fractional power, fractional power of innocent field, which is also called as innocent power. And penetration depth is actually the depth of the field uh, around the, the cladding area. And here you can see in the other picture that uh, the light is escaping around the bend of the fire and it hence interacts with the surrounding chemical interest, chemical of interest. So some of the light absorbs in the chemical and shows a change in density at the detector side of the sensor. And if there is a different chemical around it, it will show different absorbance change. Here, um, uh, we can see some significant results of the UBIN and SEN wave sensor in terms of absorbance shift with changing refractive index in water ethanol solution, corresponding to the initial ethanol production rate using LDA. So we had uh, the, the, the production rate in grams, we converted it into person, and then we converted it into the refractive index unit, which was not also available in the literature. Um, and uh, we did it using the Lorentz transfer equations, which are available in the literature, but the, uh, the conversions were not available. Uh, they can be found on the, on the publications. And so here, the first graph uh, shows results based on a broadband light source. We used a halogen lamp for that. And it shows a total absorbance sheet of 0 0.03 optical density. Uh, optical density is the unit for absorbance of light. And uh, it, it shows the result on, uh, on the total span of uh, 450 nanometer to 700 nanometer wavelength. And uh, the second graph uh, is shows the repeatability of the sensor. The repeatable results of the sensor with standard deviation of only plus minus 0 0.001945 optical density per 10 to minus 7 RIU. These results were uh, captured using a narrowband source of uh, 650 nanometer and ocean optics PV6500 spectrum, which is a scientific uh, level spectrometer. So if you see the sensor parameters, the calculated one from the results, uh, it, it can be seen that the resolution is 10 to minus 7 RU, which actually corresponds to the requirement of ultra low level ethanol concentration when during production from algal cells. And limit of detection is 9.2 into 10 to minus 7 RIU and sensitivity is 817.76 optical density per RIU. Another parameter of this uh, sensor design is that we have used plastic optical fiber for this sensor design instead of glass because plastic optical fibers are relatively low cost, easily manipulated to fabricate sensors. You know, there is, the reproducibility is very easy and their mechanical and physical robustness makes them an outstanding candidate for this application. These results and uh, some other findings of my research are uh, published in peer-reviewed journals and articles, and that can be accessed through my Google Scholar link uh, presented in the start of the uh, presentation. Um, so with this, I would like to conclude my presentation with the notion that a U-band plastic optical fiber sensor is a potential solution for real-time monitoring of the production of biofuels, even at a very low level initial concentration of product with excellent repeatability and very low standard deviation in results. This will provide real-time monitoring of ethanol production using LG at initial stages and when scale it occurs as well, which is key to enhance the yield of bioethanol. And my um, current research involves um, implementing optical fibers in actual culturing and production conditions. Of course, this was, these results were just in the water and ethanol uh, concentrations. And um, in actual culturing conditions, we will have species, uh, we'll have algae, we'll have uh, nutrients, BG11 nutrients to in the solution. So we are trying to uh, work on that and uh, designing uh, modeling those sensors for the requirement of application in actual production conditions. For that, uh, I would like to thank you for your kind attention and uh, I'm happy to uh, take the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sanova. Uh, uh, we enjoyed the full presentation. Uh, and uh, before we start the questions and answers, we've got a couple of questions for the, our audience. Uh, to see if they, uh, is that, uh, so no, but I should think we, we need to start with the first presenter. Okay, we're gonna start with Sanova, she, she's the last, but um, I 
can see Sonova questions. So Sonova, if you just uh, if you put your camera on, that's this question. Oh. Yes. Uh, check with yeah. Check with the audience uh, if they can see the poll now. So if Sonova, if you please just read the question. So uh, for, for the poll, uh, the question is, what are the main parameters to enhance the sensitivity of an evanescent with optical fiber sensors? I discussed about this in the uh, presentation. The options mm -hmm. have penetration depth, evanescent power, or both. So uh, we are waiting for our attendees to answer this, this question, please. And then Sanova, she will reveal the right uh, answer. I hope our attendees, they can see what I'm seeing in front of me. I can see the poll here. You, you can guess <laughs> also, Asana, but she will explain the right answer clearly. Ruth can help me, so I, I I can't see any. Do I have to press the button? This is my first time using the poll, so. You can't see it? I think. Um... I can see it, and mm -hmm. Ruth has also uh, mm -hmm. said that she can see it. Okay. She wants to call out the right answer. Okay. Okay, so um, th is it me who has to stop share the results? Stop share the results? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, the right answer is both one and two because these are the main parameters for the MNSN wave sensors because uh, penetration depth, uh, increase in penetration depth of an MNSN field will increase the sensitivity of the sensor and the um, fractional power or MNSN power uh, increase in that or change in that will also uh, affect the sensitivity of uh, an MNSN wave sensor. Thank you very much. And now it's Iman's time. Iman, is this your question now? Thank you, Sonova. Welcome. Iman and Dusui. So can you see your question? We can't hear you, you're muted, Iman. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you. So the, the question is about the types of fraud. So we mentioned that there is more than 200 types of telecommunication fraud detection. So the question is, is the roaming fraud one of these types of the telecommunication fraud detection? And either you choose yes or no. So it's a, a simple question. <laughs> So if I would uh, just remind you that we are talking about the, the fraud of the telecommunication, uh, that um, it has many types, but the, the, to be honest, the, the most popular one is the, the roaming fraud, because uh, many people are traveling abroad 
no, not now in the COVID, but when people are traveling and they are using the telecommunication services, uh, they don't want to pay much money. Uh, so that's why they are trying to, to overcome the, the network and the security, and they are using the roaming service without uh, paying their bills. So yes, the answer is yes, the, the roaming fraud is one of the very popular types of telecommunication fraud. Thank so, you very much, I, Iman. Yeah. I was muted. Thank you very much. You're and welcome. We, we're going to go to uh, Iman Al Ajrami, and that's her question. You can just put your camera on, Iman, and read your question and see if the audience they will remember what you discussed previously. Okay, um, the question is, uh, when does the, the proposed AI-based surveillance system enable the camera to record if a human is detected, uh, if a face is detected, or if a motion is detection, detected, or both a human and face are detected? Okay, in our presentation, we talked about uh, several types of cameras which uh, record continuously or when um, a human is detected, when a face is detected and a motion is detected. And we proposed our application which use uh, AI techniques. We've got one answer and uh, it is the right answer. So we are Yes, <laughs> okay. So the right answer is it is uh, human and face because we are constraining in people and people's body and people's faces, not any motion. So we constrain on face and body detection. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. I think Olivia. Livia, last but not least, Livia, your question. Livia, you are muted, sorry. Very sorry. Uh, I was saying thank you. And my question is, the working principle of ground penetrating radar technique is which of the following? Acoustic, electromagnetic, or electrical? If you remember from the presentation, I introduced the fact that GPR is a, a non-destructive testing methods, one of the many. So there are uh, many different techniques to carry on non-destructive testing, but ground penetrating radar particularly is based on uh, a working principle. We've got... Uh... Yeah, I see we have one answer with uh, electromagnetic and I don't know if we want to wait for somebody else to answer. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. oh, okay, the, the answer is correct. Uh, <laughs> ground penetrating radar is based on electromagnetic fre um, uh, frequencies. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Not bad. I think our uh, audience, they were listening <laughs> after all. <laughs> Uh, so thank you everyone. Uh, so now we are we're going to start the question and answer session. So our speakers, if you put your camera on, and the audience, if you've got any questions uh, for our speakers. Okay, so I will start with a question to Iman. Uh, just uh, want to ask Iman, does the digitalization have any effect on the telecom fraud? 
that's Iman and Dusuki, sorry. Yes. So, um, yes, definitely the digitalization has a great effect actually on the telecommunication fraud. Um, actually, it, uh, it makes the telecommunication both uh, as a source of the attack and itself it's the victim of the fraud. So uh, uh, fraudsters use the telecommunication after digitalization as a bridge so that they are not only attacking the telecommunication system itself, but as well they are attacking other systems through the telecommunication system, like the financial systems. So they are using the data in the telecommunication companies just as a way, and they can bridging uh, to go to the financial systems like the banks, like the uh, insurance system. So uh, yes, and we are actually facing now more than 300% growth uh, in the account takeover fraud uh, just as a way uh, to start the financial fraud from there. So it's not a, it, the digitalization is not only having a bad effect uh, on only its system, on the telecommunication system, but also it's propagating its effect to other systems. No, that's that's really very nice also. Thank you very much, Iman. I think this question is uh, to Livia from Ruth. What other fields do you see the GPR as useful for? Well, ground penetrating radar is uh, uh, commonly used for, uh, as I said in the uh, presentation, inspecting uh, man-made constructions such as, for example, uh, bridges or uh, pavements or uh, inspecting what happens underneath uh, uh, pavements such as, for example, investigating the presence of uh, uh, pipes or water leakages, for example. It is also very much used in um, uh, geosciences and uh, in, uh, um, uh, yes, all, all the other uh, applications in uh, geology, for example. So everything that relates to the investigation of the subsurface. And what depth uh, the GPR can go with? Well, this depends on the um, antenna frequency. So the frequency of the GPR that you're actually using. So the greater the frequency, uh, the um, uh, shallower depth of investigation you can reach and the other way around. If you have a lower frequency, you can get a, a greater depth of investigation. For example, in the uh, application that uh, uh, was based uh, was the base of my PhD, uh, I investigated the use of a 700 megahertz antenna that was uh, capable of uh, reaching uh, with a good. Uh, um, uh, I mean, uh, I, I could see very well the depth of the uh, tree root system, which was between one meter and one meter and a half. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. The next question is for Sonoba. So Sonoba, we all heard about uh, Industry 4. Uh, so how do you think that your research on uh, sensors will impact the Industry 4? You are muted. So um, thank you for the question. Um, um, as I discussed in my presentation that sensors are the drivers for this industry 4.0 manufacturing trend. And um, specifically talking about the industry 4.0 for biofuel ma manufacturing uh, is based on real time data from sensors. So my research on um, sensing the initial rate of production of ethanol and on when the CLF happens, this can impact uh, to the smart manufacturing side of sensors and optimize the production of bioethanol using LA and predicting the future demands um, by doing a proper data analysis of the monitored data, like uh, future demands of algal growth, future demands of uh, the ethanol production. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sanaba. Um, my other question is also for Iman Al Ajrami. So I just want to ask you, Iman, uh, you talked about the CCTV camera. So what is the value gained from developing an application 
which is already applied in modern CCTV camera. Okay, um, thank you, Doctor. Yeah, thank you, Doctor Nana, for this question. Um, the idea is about using the open source libraries. What that was offered from OpenCV. The, the idea is about to learn students how to get benefit from that uh, applications and algorithms that are ready to use. So the modern CCTV cameras was launched in 2020, as I said, but the idea started before. The idea is uh, if you don't need to replace your camera, you don't need to buy new costly cameras, you can get benefit from the open source applications and ready to use algorithms to uh, let the old camera work as intelligent as the modern cameras. This is the added value that this application make uh, cameras uh, with low cost uh, can work as uh, efficient as cameras with uh, with high cost. Uh, another thing that if there is our algorithm algorithms uh, ready to use, why not to use them to make uh, pe people lives much easier and we can get benefit from the open source and the free application that can be uh, benefit. Uh, every company and everybody. Uh, this is the most important uh, portions, but the, uh, the the most great thing is about optimization the process itself by reducing the storage and enhance the efficiency of searching the videos through the uh, ordinary CCTV cameras. And that's all the idea was about. Yeah, thank you, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for this. Just a, another question, and this is not a technical question for all of our speakers. Um, you're all coming from different uh, um, research background, and um, I can um, see that each one of you, you through your um, postgraduate study, you you had to uh, study an area which you didn't study in the uh, undergraduate. Uh, so yes. I want to ask. Uh, and I will start with Livia because I know that she's got a civil uh, engineering background in her undergraduate, but uh, she mentioned that she had to study electromagnetic, which is a pure electronic here. And so I want to, you to give our audience tips how, um, uh, how they can um, learn about uh, another field which they didn't study in their undergraduate. Uh, while they are studying for their postgraduate. I will start with Livia. Uh, and uh, I think even Iman al she mentioned image processing now, which I'm yes. not sure if she she studied in her undergraduate, but yeah. if one of you, please, if you just uh, talk about uh, how you manage to overcome this obstacle. And I will start with Livia, please. Thank you, Nagam. Well, uh, yes, as you said, uh, my background is uh, completely different. I come from uh, civil engineering. And uh, while I was doing my major, which was in uh, road transportation and infrastructures, uh, my supervisor, my thesis supervisor at the time, was a researcher into the use of non-destructive testing and particularly ground penetrating radar applied to uh, pavement engineering. And uh, so he, he proposed to me uh, this, this topic, which at the beginning uh, I didn't know, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I didn't know anything about, uh, but I found it absolutely interesting and a great application to uh, many of the problems that can arise from a uh, poor construction or a poor maintenance of uh, our uh, highways, roads and highways. And as you said, I didn't know anything about electromagnetics at the time, so I had to um, study a little bit harder, uh, carrying on my exams, and at the same time uh, doing uh, a, a bit of electromagnetic theory, and I was carrying out my thesis at the same time, but uh, I, I think that I found the uh, right people uh, beside me that helped me a lot, especially, as I said, my supervisor, which was very inspiring and very helpful. And uh, and when uh, I guess that this applies to everyone, when you find the topic, the research topic that really interests you and that you can find uh, a future for it uh, everywhere your, uh, your eyes are, I think that you are even willing to put a little bit more of yourself into this research and uh, 
this is at least what happened to me. And that's why I was so much eager to learn more and to uh, start this PhD program that was so different from what I had studied before, but it was really worth it. And I would never go back and take another road. Excellent answer. Thank you very much. What about thank you, Daniel Ajrami? Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Nara, for this uh, interesting question. In fact, I uh, didn't take image processing in my undergraduate, and totally my undergraduate study was uh, theoretical in computer science programming, general programming, and system analysis. And even my second bachelor degree in software engineering and testing uh, software architecture and uh, QA, that's all about. But uh, when I did my master's degree, I um, I did it in steganography, hiding data, security, hiding data into images. But this is my first time in image processing uh, application. Uh, when I was a lecturer, a computing lecturer, I used to introduce my students to up-to-date uh, up uh, trends in, uh, in our specialization in computing, in AI. And I was uh, the most uh, thing impressed me the, the, the huge evolution of uh, and going evolution in AI techniques and deep learning and machine learning algorithms that is beneficial for uh, image uh, analysis. And all my life, I was dreaming about to do something relative to the health sector. So I found that uh, medical image analysis and using deep learning applications that uh, help uh, doctors to diagnose diseases or uh, help uh, cardiologists to, to make decision about an image will be beneficial for the health sector and uh, health being. Uh, so I, I, uh, I'm blind to, or I'm just joined, I have just joined the uh, PhD and I'm planning, I'm planning to work hard, study hard. And there's a lot of training uh, tutorials and courses on the internet, on Coursera and uh, other platforms that I can uh, get benefit. In addition to my university and my research group, uh, they are amazing and cooperative the group with the with the, the directions of my supervisor and he helped me uh, with giving me the links that I need uh, I need to develop uh, myself more and more and to train myself on uh, more and more before uh, starting to work deeply in my thesis yeah this is the idea <laughs> I wish you all the best Ivan yeah, thank you so much you to know, but... Unmute yourself, please. So um, uh, I understand that the question is that how I moved to the field of optical fiber sensing and um, from the electronic engineering field. So um, I would say that my uh, bachelor's project was an artificial neural networks. And then I, uh, when I was doing my master's, I met my professor in one of the international conferences uh, my now professor for my PhD. And um, I was really uh, fascinated by his talk on optical fiber sensing for different real time applications like uh, real world applications like medicine, um, food quality, uh, chemical. So from there it, it started uh, a conversation uh, with my uh, PhD supervisor and then um, it went on uh, further from there, but of course, optical fiber sensing was not my not my expertise. Um, I was more of electronics, artificial neural networks, and um, someone with uh, more of like robotic side. Um, but of course, uh, this is a very really interesting field, and you can see the results in front of your eyes when you do the experiments. It's very interesting to see that how how the results are changing with just a small chemical change. So it kept me motivated. And of course, the, the application of my project is um, based on biofuel processing and the sensors. And sensors are part of everything um, um, uh, nowadays and everything like in our mobiles, in our home, in our, um, you know, the con if you talk, just talk about consumer side, if you go on industrial side, they are everywhere. So, um, so, the, so the world is going all, towards the advancement of technology, aiding the sensors because sensors are giving us data. 
And this world is actually going to be data driven after a while. Even I would say now the world is data driven. So I think um, from there, um, I think it starts the, for me, for me, the uh, research and sensing and then data and then for sports like uh, data analysis later on and IoT and industry 4.0. So that keeps me motivated for this field. <laughs> and uh, I would like to motivate other people to come towards this field because um, this is uh, this is something that you see in front of you that oh, how the results are changing and how uh, how you can make a difference in uh, this uh, technology advancement. Excellent. Also, thank you very much. You. Last but not least, Iman. Yes. Um, so uh, actually, uh, from my point of view, I think that we are every day, actually, and maybe every minute we are learning new things. So even the technology is being changing every now and then. So the things that we already took in our education in the faculty and in the university is changing by time. So this gives us more flexibility even to, to change our minds and to investigate new areas and to look something like the IoT and the blockchain and in the software engineering and in software architecture, the essence. So all these things are relatively new things. And if everyone is only stuck with what he already studied in the university so there won't be there won't be any innovations and creativity so that's why i'm encouraging everybody just to um, uh, look around and investigate different areas and it's nice to see different things and learn more about everything and once you find the thing that you are really interested about this will be the point from where you will really innovate things and you will really create different things and this is how things are innovated and new technologies are invented because um, we need to, to investigate different areas we need even to to merge two different fields together and then we can get new inventions and, and new ideas for new things. Thank you, speaker, very much for sharing your experience. Uh, each one of you, you tackled my question from your own point of view and from your own experience. And I'm, I'm sure the listeners, they will really benefit from your talk, or they will maybe um, find that they did the same uh, so that will encourage them to continue doing the right thing uh, so uh, um i finish with my questions and answers uh, and it is back to you Odelik. thank you very much um, not, uh, um so at this point we we'll move to the evaluation form and um i'm going to post um, the link and I'll be on the uh, audience uh, participants to please click on um, the link and just fill in the evaluation form and um, their site within four days we will send you an e um, certificate. I would like also to welcome a blessing. Blessing if you would like also to talk more about the um, evaluation form and process. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't know blessing is here. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, blessing, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. Hello, blessing, you're muted. Can she hear me? Hi everyone. Hi, blessing. Thank it's you. Host, here. <laughs> thank you, host, for unmuting me. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. think it's been a very um, valuable session. So I caught the final segments of that and just hearing um, Sanoba talking about data and the fact that data is quite prevalent now. I think data is really powerful now. So I completely agree with you. 
we've got an evaluation form. Would we just like to put the link in the chat box for everyone? And it's all right. We really, we really like to get your your feedback. It's the first event that we've run in this series. So for us, it's so important that we get your feedback, how the event has been. We've got a couple of questions there. If you could please um, fill in those um, questions for us, that would be very useful. And the purpose of the feedback is just to inform us. So the next time we run an event, we'd really like to take that evaluation into consideration and just continue to improve our events. If you found this first one useful, I believe our speakers will also like to hear the feedback because they've put in a lot of time to prep for this event. So it's really useful if you could go to the link that has just been shared in the chat box and please leave us some feedback just to help us improve. Thank you so much. I'll hand back to Udwak now. All right, thank you very much, Blessing. And it's good to have you here. And um, so I'd like to- I think uh, uh, the, the also, if you please, when you are filling this evaluation uh, form, there is a, a section at the end to provide your uh, email so we can uh, send you the e-certificate. So the attendees for this workshop, uh, they will receive an uh, e-certificate uh, for attending this workshop. So if you, we've got your email, we'll definitely will be able to email you back uh, the e-certificate. So it is very important for, uh, for us just to have your email. So we will be able to um, send you the yeah. All right, Please thank you. Someone check the evaluation form because I tried it, but I didn't find anything else submit. The question is not available for me. Okay, I just give me a moment. I have to check. Okay. Yeah, it's it's there. I just open it if you want me to share the screen. So if you click that, it's going to open um this. So you have you have this. And we have responses so far. So this is what you're going to have when you click on the link. Emma, can you see that? Yeah. Okay, yeah. I think at the beginning we couldn't, but then it, uh, it linked us to the right uh, website. I wonder, Iman, if you are able to access it now? Yeah, uh, yeah, I can send it to you. At, uh... Okay, so I'd like to invite Iman for the closing remark. So uh, thank well, you I give you for attending. For you. Yes. Yes, uh, so thank you so much for attending this workshop. I hope uh, you enjoyed the, the four talks and you get benefit from every one of us and from our experience. And so we need more uh, experiences and we are looking forward for any one of you who needs to be our next speaker. So uh, if you have any success story, if you have any achievement, if you've published a, a nice paper, uh, if you want to talk about your challenges, your opportunities, so you are well, more than welcome just to scan the QR, uh, the QR code that is in this uh, uh, flyer. And then this will redirect you to an e-form in which you will write your contact details. And if you want to join and be our next speaker in this uh, series, that is the early career talk, or even if you are happy to participate in any other uh, workshops that we are intending to, to do many different series of workshops and activities. So you can just uh, write down what you are interested to join in. And we are more than happy uh, for 
many uh, of the, the volunteers who can participate and help inspiring other engineers and other women in engineering. So thank you again. And you can try the QR code and even you can give us the dates that you are happy to participate in. Uh, even if it's not the early career talk, maybe it can be another activity. Uh, and we will post our next uh, date for the early career talk. Uh, I think it will be in October. However, it will be in the, the website and in the Eventbrite. So uh, looking forward for more, of you, uh, more people to join and to help us. Uh, and see you again in the next uh, workshop. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank, thank you so, so much. much. Um, thank you so much. So for me, um, I would just like to thank the speakers and the attendees and for um, today's webinar. And thank you so much. And please, I'll ask that you just give the feedback by filling in the survey. And I'll also ask that you stay tuned. Our next event, just like Kimana said, is coming up on the 16th of October and um, it's been an honor to have you and I hope that um, in the next event our workshop we have and we always look up to you and you dare to come as a speaker and as attendees as well and I remain thank you very much for having me at this juncture I hand it over to Dr. Nadan to close it thank you Eric. thank you for our brilliant audience who made this uh, workshop special. Thank you for our speakers and for their time and for the amazing uh, uh, presentation they gave. Uh, I think this program, this early talk program is a unique uh, experience for the speakers and the audience to witness talk from speakers who uh, are not only from different universities or different countries, but they also have different research background. We had uh, optical, we had about optical fiber, with, uh, we had about artificial intelligence engineering, uh, environmental engineering, uh, uh, telecommunication. Uh, it, it is a chance to listen to um, other research area which, are, which we are not involved in and um, see how uh, science is progressing in that field. Uh, so uh, that's the aim of this a workshop. We hope that we, we covered that well. We are calling for all women in engineering and computing to give technical inspirational talk and empowering section. So this, this program is supporting women from academia and industry. So you had Iman al Dusui's talk. It was a combination from industry and academia and the other three speakers there, um, uh, Iman Al-Ajrami and uh, Livia uh, and Sanoba, that it was more academic uh, and all, they all were from different background. And so we, we support any successful women who are coming from academia or engineering uh, who've been in their position for less than 10 years. Uh, as Odwick mentioned, and I will mention again, uh, the next event will be on Saturday, the 16th of October, 2021, uh, because it is a series of work uh, uh, of uh, webinars. Uh, so please, again, fill the form which is mentioned to you previously, and you can see it also in the event of Bright. Uh, so you can use it to help you to uh, access the form and just put your information there and we will contact you if you showed your interest. Uh, again, thank you very much for the uh, ambassador team for uh, the hard work. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with them. Uh, Iman and Odo and Blessing, you've been doing a great job. I'm, I'm very happy to be part, just to lead um, and be part of this amazing team. Uh, um, I enjoyed working with you and I'm looking forward to, for other events. So thank you very much for everyone. And uh, by this, I will end this session. Thank you. Thanks, Marta. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.
We didn't take a, didn't take a screenshot. I will invite. I want to invite the others to have a screenshot before we end this. Oh, oh, that's true. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, can you that. invite the others? Just we want to take a screenshot for everyone with the camera on. Yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> yeah, I will try to take some. Oh, the recording is there. Let me just stop it.